Hello, everyone. This is Rose Langner, and welcome to the Better Buildings Alliance Plug and Process Load Technical Team Biannual Call. Uh, we're going to start in just a couple minutes here. I'm going to allow a couple more people to join join the, the webinar. Okay, thanks. Hi, everyone. We will be starting in just one minute. Thank you. Hey, hello everyone, and welcome to today's biannual team call for the Better Buildings Alliance Plug and Process Load Technical Team. Again, this is Rose Langner from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and I will be introducing today's call. Next slide. The agenda will include an introduction to the team players for the Plug and Process Load Technical Team. Uh, we'll also provide a number of updates, including upcoming events, publications, and new research that the team is working on. Uh, and then we're excited to have a technical presentation that will be provided by Allison Kant at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory on a plug load management system field study looking at a wireless meter and control technology. Um, after that, we'll leave some room for questions and answers and additional member updates. Please note that this call is being recorded and we will be posting the recording to the Better Building Solutions Center afterwards. We'll provide a link and an email as well to all the members. And if you have any questions or comments during the call, please type your questions into the question input field. Um, thank you. Uh, next slide. And first, some news. Uh, we have a couple transitions happening. We um, have transitioned a couple of the technical team leads. I've been the technical team lead of the plug and process load technical team for many years now, and I'm transitioning over to lead the Better Buildings Alliance Renewables Integration Team, which is focused on strategic integration of renewable energy sources into buildings and building portfolios as well as how buildings can be an asset to utilities as the utility landscape evolves to include more renewable energy sources. In particular, we will be investigating how buildings can provide load flexibility options for utilities and better grid coordination. Um, so the, the website is listed on, or there's a link to it on the slide, and we haven't had a team call in a long time, but we are excited to announce our upcoming call on April 9th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. During this call, we will have an exciting conversation on building load flexibility and grid coordination. Uh, Monica Newcomb, Senior Policy Advisor in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at DOE, will provide will provide an introduction to the Department of Energy's research interests and stakeholder efforts with utilities and state policymakers in this area. Uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute will also present new research conducted with the General Services Administration, GSA, to understand the value of commercial buildings to utilities and providing a resource for load flexibility and capacity to respond to demand requests. Uh, again, the registration link is provided in the slide, slide deck, which Kim Trenbath will send out after the call, and we really hope that you can join us. Next slide. 
So I'm excited to stay within the Better Buildings Alliance world, and it's my absolute pleasure to announce that my colleague, Dr. Kim Trenbath, will be taking over as the technical lead for the Plug and Process Load team. I've worked closely with Kim for many years, and I'm pleased to leave you in such good hands. And with that, I'd like to pass the baton over to her. So here's, I hand it over to you, Kim. Thanks. Thanks, Rose. Thank you very much. Um, as Rose said, I've been working at NREL, and I've actually been here for six years. Uh, I've been on the PPL technical team for a year, but prior to that, I've been, uh, I did some research on plug and process loads in commercial buildings. Um, some of the research that I worked on is um, a publication called Energy Savings and Usability of Zero Client Computing in Office Settings, and that was also written by Amanda Farthing and Rose Langner. Um, the other work that I work on at NREL includes fault detection and diagnostics in commercial buildings, zero energy K-12 schools, and student competitions for the building sciences. I'm also an adjunct professor for cornerstone design at the Colorado School of Mines. We're excited to also welcome a new technical team member, um, Bennett Doherty. He is a research engineer at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. He focuses on plug and process loads research in commercial buildings and residential research, residential building research with the Building America program. His interest in building science began as a participant in the DOE solar decathlon design competition in which his collegiate team designed a zero energy elementary school. Bennett has a BA in physics from Middlebury College in Vermont. So welcome Bennett. Um, also, um, New to the team is a member of our technical team support from Waypoint Energy. In the last call, we introduced Katie Vrabel, and she is a director at Waypoint Energy, and she began supporting the PPL team in July of 2018. We're happy to welcome Carly Burke, an associate at Waypoint Energy. She began supporting the PPL team in November of 2018. Carly has six years of experience in energy efficiency standards and labeling programs, voluntary public-private par partnerships, and market transformation initiatives. She has a broad understanding of the utility incentive programs. She has a BA from the University of Maryland College Park. So welcome, Carly. Now moving on to some upcoming events that I'd like you all to be aware of. Um, we're excited for the 2019 Better Building Summit, which will be held July 10th through 11th in Arlington, Virginia. Um, I would like to highlight a session that relates to plug-in process loads, and this is the Beyond Widgets Multi-Technology Integration and Connect Connected Systems um, session that the plug-in process load team will be hosting at the Better Building Summit. Um, during this session, attendees will learn how efficiencies can be found in coordinating controls for different building end uses. We will highlight innovative approaches to controlling plug loads with other systems such as lighting and HVAC. And the session will include highlights from a field evaluation of LED systems equipped with advanced lighting controls that interface with HVAC systems and plug loads. The registration is now open for the Better, for the better Building Summit. And um, we look forward to, um, our team looks forward to seeing you there. Another upcoming event that I want to put on everyone's radar is the U.S. Department of Energy Building Technologies Office Peer Review. This is April 15th through 18th in Arlington, Virginia. Um, this is open to all and it's free, but registration is required for admission to the presentation. The peer review is a review of selected projects across BTO's entire portfolio. So this no this no uh, excuse me this not only includes um, commercial buildings integration, but it also includes um, the residential organization and emerging technologies. During peer review, independent experts will assess the progress and contributions of each project toward BTO's mission and goals. Peer review is also a time to assess the management of existing efforts and collaborate on the design of future programs. And this is a great opportunity for those in buildings research, in the buildings research community and industry to collaborate. Um, I also want to point out that 
Related to the Better Buildings Alliance, there's going to be a portfolio review that focuses on the partnership and potentially the Better Buildings campaign. So this is where this project would align. Moving on to some publications that I would like to highlight. Um, one publication that just was released in February 2019 was a technical report on the plug load management system field study. This report was written by Allison Kant and Rose Langner. Uh, this, I'm not going to talk more about this right now because Allison Kant is going to present on the findings of this report later in today's webcast. I also want to highlight a publication that was released in Intelligent Buildings International, a peer-reviewed building science journal, um, in September 2018. This is the publication titled Energy Savings and Usability of Zero Client Computing in Office Buildings. Um, this was authored by Amanda Farthing, Rose Langner, and Kim Trenbath. Um, we investigated the energy use of zero client computing compared to traditional workstations from both a workstation approach and a whole building approach. And if you're not familiar with zero clients, these are devices that act as a shell um, for a normal um, personal computer where all the computation is, and data storage is done on a server. We found that uh, average power of zero client workstations were 16.4 to 31.5% less than traditional workstations that use uh, a laptop for computation during occupant occupied hours, but when we factor in data center power use, which um, was estimated, um, the amount of energy used for zero clients was higher than traditional workstations for this particular study location. Um, but this is expected to change due to efficiencies in both laptops and servers. A future publication that we have been working on for a long time is our landscaping study on integrating smart plug and process load controls into energy management information system platforms. This is in the final stages of publication. This research highlights the wireless, the current state of the wireless plug load meter and control market, how PPL controls already integrate into BAS and EMIS platforms, where the market is heading, gaps to fill in order to push the market forward, and recommended research areas for the national lab. And finally, I want to highlight some new, new research that's in the pipeline. Um, NREL is conducting research on office plug load modeling and device level disaggregation. Um, in this, for this research, we're really trying to answer the question, how can a limited number of individual monitoring devices and building level submeters be used to develop a disaggregated breakdown of plug loads in an office building? So what we did so far here is we have looked at um, the load profiles monitored, metered by a few of these devices for um, an office building that also has a submeter for the plug load. And we're trying to find value, we're identifying that there's a lot of value in this dis disaggregation, um, especially learning what products are being brought on, on brought online at, and at what time. Um, um, and finding value in having these devices meter um, a handful of plug loads rather than the entire building plug loads. And then highlighting the la latter two um, um, areas of new research. One, both are informed by the guidance that came out of our landscaping study, and we are currently scoping the research for these. The first one is interoperability of plug load controls with other building systems and EMIS platforms. We're investigating where the market is going and what is needed to encourage greater interoperability. And for this pro research, we perhaps will reach out to some of our partners, so stay tuned for that. The other um, area of research is looking at automatic and dynamic identification of connected devices and looking to see how this could reshape um, the way that plug loads are um, managed in a building. 
And also we might reach out further for that information. Um, so um, stay tuned for an email um, coming from us. And that is all the updates that I have for the um, PPL technical team. Now we're going to move into our guest presentation. Um, our guest presenter is Allison Kant. She is a senior mechanical engineer at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Allison provides assistance in assessing technical and economic potential of renewable energy, energy efficiency, and water efficiency opportunities, as well as providing technical support of projects. Allison's research interests focus on the evaluation of emergent technologies, the water energy food nexus, particularly the, quant particularly the quantification of energy uses of water um, infrastructure, and on the glint glare impacts of associated with associated with photovoltaic systems. Allison holds an MS in mechanical engineering from the University of Colorado at Boulder and a BS in mathematics from the University of the Puget Sound. And so now I will turn this over um, to Allison. Thank you, Kim. Next slide, please. So thank you all for joining me and all of us today. Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are at. Here's just a quick overview of my presentation. I'm gonna talk just kind of, again, quick snapshot of why we tested this technology with a little bit of background in the plug loads, an introduction into the technology and an overview of the field study we conducted. And then I'll run through the quantitative and qualitative results from that study and then leave you with some lessons learned and we'll have some time for Q&A. Next slide, Kim. So again, I think largely the bulk of you are familiar with plug and process loads, but if there's somebody new to this group or this topic, just one quick slide snapshot. Uh, plug and process loads are those loads that are plugged into electrical outlets in buildings, so such as your computers, coffee makers, printers, um, and they also encompass hardwired loads. So those would be things like fire detectors, escalators, they're really any load that is not associated with a major building system, such as your heating and ventilation system, your lighting system, uh, to basically everything else. So why, why do we care about these? They're, they're very little, but a lot of these little loads add up to a lot. Uh, plug and process loads consume about one third of primary energy in the US, uh, in US commercial buildings. And it's further important because as buildings become more efficient, then the plug and process load efficiency becomes more relevant to achieving aggressive targets. So as those large building systems that I mentioned, our HVAC, our lighting systems, even building envelopes become more uh, sophisticated and efficient, we're seeing that PPLs make up a larger piece of the pie. And so we're really needing to start to hone in on those and savings opportunities associated with them. As the bottom table uh, demonstrates the savings potential associated with plug and process loads is quite large in commercial buildings for the individual equipment or individual device it's estimated between 10 and 50 about 50 percent savings potential and then on a whole building level that equates to between 6 and 10 percent savings potential so there's a lot of opportunity out there next slide For this field study, we tested the IBIS Intelli Network plug load management system. So it's comprised of intelligent socket devices. These are what you can see in the image. Uh, these are you know, very straightforward. They plug directly into an existing electrical outlet, and then you plug your device into that directly into that socket, and they collect energy usage information on that device. Uh, the system also is comprised of a gateway which manages communication between that socket and the PLM cloud service. And then the system is, is also comprised of a PLM network. It's a cloud-based measurement and control network for the entire system, and it includes an online interface and dashboard where all of the data can be visualized, analyzed, and where the controls can be set for the plug load management system. The vendor, IBIS, estimates a potential plug load savings of between 20 and 50%. Next slide. So for this field study, we tested this technology in two, two locations. One was in Chandler, Arizona. It's a pet-oriented retail store. 
And the top left graphic is representative of that test location. We identified about 40 or exactly 46 devices for potential inclusion in this study. Uh, I do want to, and I'll talk about this later in Lessons Learned, but kind of caveat it or explain that at the onset, we identified 46 potential devices. Um, after looking at that data in more detail, we had intended to control 11 of those of those, and in reality, only five were controlled and had a full set of data. So I think that that's an important consideration and caveat to keep in mind as we start stepping through some of the findings. And when we do that, I'll talk through why those numbers were so different than what we had intended and hoped for. For test location B, it was in Honolulu. It's an eyewear manufacturer and retail store. Uh, at that site, you can see we had, you know, many more devices intended or identified for the pilot, 130. That's the bottom left graphic. The bulk of those were uh, office and retail equipment was the majority and then followed by optometry, optometry equipment in the gray. And just real fast to that top graphic, the big yellow portion is pet care equipment. So this is a pet-oriented retail store for our test location A and the bulk of that equipment was associated with pet care. Um, and then the, the just electric rates are on the bottom. So Arizona having a little bit lower rates at 12 cents in Honolulu at higher rates at 30 cents per kilowatt hour. And you can also see when we look at the economic metrics that those electric rates obviously drove the economics a little bit to the economic results. Next slide, please. So for our testing protocol, there was an equipment inventory and PLM installation period when the technology was installed. Both of those were conducted by the vendor IBIS. Uh, following that period, we then did a baseline period. You can see at both locations, it was approximately four weeks. Following that baseline period, we, Rose and I at NREL, the vendor IBIS, and then our partners at the retail stores collectively looked at the data, analyzed the data, and identified uh, devices for control. Uh, we recommended ones that we would like to see controlled and then based on input from the store operators, you know, some of those fell out for, you know, they were excluded for certain reasons, potentially a device type that, that just they didn't want controlled or for safety reasons um, wanted excluded. So that, that reduced the subset of devices that we were able to control. And then we implemented a controlled period. They were the same length as the baseline period, again, pretty close to that four week period. Um, next slide. So we, at the onset of this project, developed an MNV plan, which contained both quantitative and qualitative objectives that we were wanting to study and examine the outcomes for. So for the quantitative ones, those are identified here. They included measuring electricity savings. We were hoping to see, the success criterion that we were hoping to see was electricity savings compared to the baseline of at least 10% in measured plug loads. Uh, for cost effectiveness, we were examining both the simple payback and the savings to investment ratio, looking for a payback period of less than 10 years and an SIR of greater than one. And then for deployability, we were really wanting to see favorable payback and savings to investment ratio that were not only achieved just in this field study site, but also in a broader rollout, you know, potential hypothetical rollout at other sites in um, that retailer's portfolio. So looking for broad deployability beyond just this study site. Next slide. So the findings associated with this field study at both sites, you can see the metered electric consumption met our success criterion at both sites with 11% uh, savings at test location A, 18% at test location B. Um, the economics, neither of them met our success criterion, and one big uh, component of that was the fact that at neither location were we able to control the full number of devices that we had intended to control. And so there were some complicating factors um, that I'll talk about more in lessons learned, but it had to do with uh, many devices. We didn't get a full data set for the control period, and so they had to be excluded. Um, and, and so that was the biggest driver of the economics. Next slide. And then deployability. So unfortunately, due to that unfavorable payback and a, a savings to investment ratio, it was unlikely that there would be broad deployability potential. 
Um, however, again, there's this caveat of there were some of these complications during the pilot that negatively affected those outcomes. So, uh, you know, there is a potential that had those not happened, uh, you know, there could be better um, economic return on investment at, at, in a different deployment or a different situation. Next slide. So the qualitative objectives were uh, are defined here. The first one was ease of installation. So we were planning and had, we did uh, interview the vendor and the retail representative with questions such as the time required to install and configure the system, the labor associated with the install and the impact of install on the operation. So the success criterions were that it was less than a day to install, less than a week to provide online data access to both us and to the retailer. Um, and then the operability components, this was, this was uh, understood with an interview with the retailer representative. This was looking at things like the usability of the Intel sockets, the usability of the network, and then the time requirement for continual management. So the great success me metrics of consent success were that there was no impact to operations and maintenance effort and less than four hours to understand the online data interface. And then the non-energy benefits, we were really hoping to see at least one non-energy benefit realized. So an example of that could be, for instance, that the vendor touts that this technology can help with device, um, device health management and monitoring. So by closely monitoring performance of a device, you could potentially see performance getting worse and you know, preemptively realize that it's failing and change that out. So that's one example of a non-energy benefit. Next slide. So the qualitative findings for the time required to install the system, it was less than a day at test location A and it was nine hours at test location B. So it was, that one was, you know, they were both right around what we were hoping for, less than about a full day. Um, for, the for the vendor time to configure and provide online data access to the interface was about two to three days for both test locations. So that met what we were looking for. And then the impact of install on operations it was really minimal. Uh, it was minimal to none, so that was great. Next slide. So for operability, we were looking at the usability of the IntelliSockets at test location A. They informed us that it was very easy and intuitive at test location B. They also said it was easy and intuitive. However, they did encounter some problems with devices not functioning as intended after the controls were deployed. And there were many, many sockets that the staff unplugged or deactivated uh, as a result of that. And so, again, that was one of the factors that drove the economics because um, a lot of the devices intended for control ended up not actually being controlled. Um, the usability of the online interface, this is another really important lesson learned um, and a kind of unfortunate outcome is that neither of, the, of our retail partners really were able to use the online interface enough to even be able to provide feedback. And so we did find that that was one of the limitations uh, or potentially, you know, one of the barriers of the study is that it, the fact that they weren't act, uh, actively monitoring the devices, the device performance and the data coming in made it so that I think we missed some opportunities associated with savings and with troubleshooting when devices had been or sockets had been uh, unplugged. And then the time commitment for monitoring and management, you know, and this is tied to the previous note, but staff really felt, you know, they didn't have the one to two hours needed per week to manage the or to, to actively monitor the online interface and the information coming in. And so I think that was a big barrier uh, to success associated with some of those uh, quantitative <laughs> metrics for the economics. Next slide. And then lastly, non-energy benefits. So for test location A, there, there wasn't any realized. For B, this was a site where uh, some of the staff did kind of interact with the sockets and, and actually did, you know, try to overwrite it. And there was lots of good engagement with staff about plug load management and plug load energy use. And so that in itself, I think, was a great non-energy benefit just to start that dialogue. Next slide. 
So just some key takeaways, and this is where I'll go into a little bit of some of the nuances of the study and the real world testing, but you know, real world testing resulted in real world complications for us for this field study uh, at test location A, Mother Nature really uh, threw us for a loop and uh, the store was actually flooded. So during the baseline period, many, uh, many pieces of their equipment were destroyed and lost. Some of the sockets were destroyed. Uh, or lost or damaged. And so we actually had to go, we didn't, but IBIS and the store together uh, remapped some of those sockets onto different devices and we had to start a new baseline period. So it resulted in a smaller subset uh, and kind of a smaller opportunity base than we had initially envisioned for that site. The second uh, note, sockets gone missing, happened at both stores. And, you know, I'm not sure the value, you know, I don't think anybody's stealing these sockets. They don't necessarily have a value without the rest of the system components. So, you know, it leads us to believe that people either were a little leery of what that socket was doing, they maybe hadn't been educated on it, or, or they were, you know, legitimately experiencing some problems with, with those controls and, again, weren't informed or empowered on how to get answers and best, you know, override or best handle those. So that also at both stores led to a much smaller subset of control data uh, to base those economics and savings calculations on than we had an envision initially envisioned. So again, just a quick snapshot of the numbers at site A, that's the pet oriented store in Arizona. From the baseline period, we baselined 46 devices. We identified 11 for control. And then at the conclusion of the control period, we only had a full subset of data for five of those. So um, the other six had either been unplugged or experienced large portions of data loss that made it so that we could not include them in our calculations. At the test site B, which was the one in the eyewear manufacturer and retail store in Hawaii, we had baseline 130 devices and then hit into control 54. And then we ended up with only a full subset of data for a set of data for a subset of 19 of those devices. So the balance of those, again, were either unplugged or experienced large data losses. So again, I can't emphasize enough that uh, you know, I think those economic numbers would largely be improved upon if, uh, you know, we had better data sets that were more inclusive of all the devices that showed potential for savings and that we had intended to control. And then the last takeaway here is just staff engagement. I also can't emphasize that enough. I think that all the way from having, you know, the top down of having a really vested champion on board for your uh, for your deployment of this technology is key. They're going to be the person that's interfacing with the technology, that's monitoring it regularly to make sure that it's performing, that can flag devices that potentially have been unplugged or that data isn't coming through. And they can also identify sockets uh, that or devices that the savings aren't, you know, what they had thought they would be in troubleshoot or move that socket to another device. And then all the way down to the staff, um, you know, working in the retail location, including the janitorial staff. And so we found at both of these locations, this was really complicated to reach out to everybody with messaging and educational background on this technology, on the intent of this project on how to override and, and work with the technology if needed, and then who to contact. We uh, found that both stores had multiple shifts. They operate you know, on weekends and holidays. Uh, and so you know, even if the messaging was making it maybe from to one manager down to the staff one day, it was missing you know, a second and third tier of the staff or of shift of the staff. Um, and so, and also the janitorial staff are largely not included. So I think that that, Part of that is indicative of, um, you know, kind of it led to us seeing a bunch of these sockets becoming unplugged. Next slide. And then other key takeaways, just you know, honing in on and where where we do see some successful deployment conditions would be areas with higher electricity rates. I think, you know, just even looking at the paybacks from these two pilots, the Hawaii site was 30 cents per kilowatt hour and the payback was, you know, a little bit better at about 29 years and the Arizona site was at 12 cents a kilowatt hour was 
you know, in the 50 years. So that obviously has other factors included in it, but the higher electricity rates is going to help drive down the, um, the payback period and help improve the economics. Look for a site with many controllable devices. So, you know, things, site, uh, excuse me, devices that um, will cause interruptions to business operations, reduction in sales. These are ones that you would not want to control, not want to include. And so operations that have many of those are going to be ones that maybe aren't a great focus for a technology like this. Other devices that you may want not want to consider are ones that would have health and safety concerns if, uh, if unplugged or unactivated. Um, uh, ones that maybe have shutdown procedures or require reconfiguration on start. And so that was something that we saw, you know, at one of the, at the pet store or at the pet retail location was there were some devices that, um, you know, had such a lengthy startup process that they couldn't be deactivated. And so really um, honing in on appropriate devices for control is really important. Um, and then looking for stores with multiple uh, duplicate or similar stores or operations, I think can really help you study one pilot store and then be able to identify, you know, extrapolate potential savings to those other stores. Um, there's also the potential, like I mentioned, to, you know, if you have a great champion who's actively monitoring the information, you know, maybe you identify a subset of devices that are not able to be controlled at your first pilot store. You can take those sockets and move them onto a second location. Uh, and so, you know, if you have similar operations, there's some economies of scale and potential to, to move things around to keep gathering information and keep making informed decisions iteratively. And then lastly, you know, the champion is just so important having a staff member who can spend, we're estimating one to two hours per week, I think, you know, after maybe this this is implemented and all the kinks are worked out, maybe it's not quite so laborious, but I do think continual interaction with the online interface and with the data really is important to keep track of where there's devices that have been unplugged or data that's not coming in or where there's additional opportunities for savings that maybe haven't been capitalized on um, is really going to help best uh, optimize the economics associated with these type of systems. And then beyond monitoring the data, furthermore, just communicating with staff continually. You know, there's continual change outs of staff, new staff co coming on board. And so um, kind of an ongoing educational campaign uh, from that champion down, you know, through the managers, through everybody really that's going to be interacting with these systems, including signage about what the device is, who to contact, and how to uh, override or um, operate the system if needed. Next slide. So like Kim mentioned, uh, Rose and I are excited to, to point you to the study. It was just recently published in February. The link is here and I encourage you to go take a look at it. And then of course, reach out to Rose and I if you have any questions. At this time, that wraps up my presentation today and I believe we're gonna open up for a Q&A. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Um, our, and yes, we are going to move on to questions and um, specifically about this presentation first, and then um, up and then move on to membered updates. So we did have one question come in um, for Allison, and that question is, um, oh, we have a couple coming in. So yes, please. Um, Please put those into your um, chat boxes and we are collecting them. Uh, the first one is, I am curious about how did you get the baseline energy consumption? So we used the sockets, which gather data for the plugged in devices. It collects baseline data. So um, the system, the PLM, IBIS PLM system that we tested is great for even just baselining data because I know doing, you know, having access to baseline data or usage data for plug loads is something that's often really hard to procure. Most, mostly those systems aren't, aren't sub-metered. And so this serves as a great uh, system just for baselining and quantifying the loads associated with plug loads. So we just used the sockets um, and plugged in devices that we had thought uh, could have high potential for savings and then measured that data just 
kind of in a business as usual standard operating environment for those it was about approximately four weeks for each of those sites and then that data goes and into the online interface and then we were able to analyze that data the uh, ibis system does do some analytics where it analyzes the baseline data uh, and and generates potential savings and suggestions of which devices to control and how to control them. And then uh, Rose and I also independently did some analysis on that data. And then we resolved, you know, our findings with IBIS suggestions. And again, then vetted that with the retailers to get their buy-in on which devices to to actually control. And hi everyone, this is Rose. Um, just to add to that too. The sockets themselves uh, collect data down to the minute level. Um, so that's the data that we were able to use for that. Additionally, the, the sockets are wireless and they communicate using a Zigbee communication protocol. So that's how they communicate uh, via a, a mesh network back to the, the gateway and then the gateway is connected via ethernet to the cloud services there. Um, and that connection allows you to collect the data wirelessly and also implement the controls through the online dashboard. So I'll just add that to what Allison just said. Thanks, Rose. Those are both important. Those are important implications. And we have a second question, and I'm going to modify this a little bit. Um, what is the main cost impacting the poor economics? So uh, this was largely driven by the fact that uh, the bulk of the devices we identified as showing promise for having good economics based uh, if we activated controls um, didn't actually get a, end up being able to be controlled and included in our study. Um, so again, it was five of 11 and then 19 of 54 that we intended to control ended up having data and controls activated for the entirety of our control period. So the savings realized were therefore dramatic, drastically reduced and that impacted the savings. Um, there's also associated with these devices, uh, you know, there's equipment costs associated with them and there's a software as a service fee, a monthly fee that is paid per device and so, or per socket. And so that also obviously impacts economics. I do think that if you were to deploy these in an application where, you know, you were actively controlling the devices, uh, and realizing savings associated with those that investment and with that SAS fee, that would really, you know, improve the economics associated with with the investment of the system. Okay, great. And I have a third question. Um, how did you decide which devices to monitor, and how many smart plugs did you use for each location? Um, so for the devices to monitor, again, and this is another kind of key takeaway, I think Rose and I looking back, or if we could do this again, would love to go and be a part of the initial equipment inventory and visiting the site and installing this. I think that there was a little bit um, of us, you know, not having a full snapshot of the um, loads and the plug loads in these applications. And then we also further had problems at the store that flooded because um, IBIS kind of remotely supported the store and remapping those sockets and I think that complicated it a little bit but um, so IBIS visited the store and did a walkthrough with the our kind of main retailer uh, point of contact or the champion and they based on the knowledge and expertise of that retailer contact started identifying devices just for the baseline period and so the baseline period is very a low risk from an operational perspective and that we're not controlling anything we're not changing operations of any of those devices and so uh, the retailer felt you know fairly confident hopefully really confident and doing baselining and installing these sockets on many many different device types and so um, we we just installed them on a kind of a plethora of representative devices for those different applications so for the pet retailer it it you know obviously differed greatly from the eyewear manufacturer and retail store, but we were trying to get a good sampling of devices that were representative of 
most of the plug load devices in the store. Uh, if the retailer knew at the onset that a certain device was not going to be able to be allowable as a controlled device, then we um, likely excluded it from the baseline. Although, again, um, it can be disinformative to really quantify the energies associated with those different devices. So then, um, based on the data we got in that baseline period, we just examined it for high energy use periods that were happening during non-usage times of those certain devices. And so a great example at the uh, pet retail store that we saw, you know, that was really high and kind of an outlier was the grooming tables. And so um, it was happening, you know, there was high energy usage happening overnight where, you know, no grooming was happening. And so we would, you know, we immediately honed it on that, had some dialogue with our point of contact at the retail store about, you know, what are the operations associated with these grooming tables? Why are these there these high loads at night? Is this something that we could deactivate? And so that's just one example where we were really looking for energy usage that was in off periods or um, kind of an outlier and then started some dialogue with the champion about whether or not that would be something that we could control. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, I think that's the questions that we have, but now I'd like to turn it um, back towards the team members that are on the call. So I appreciate all of you guys being here. Um, so I'm- Kim, there's one, uh, there's one more that was typed in that I oh, see. Okay. It says it was mentioned, yeah, it says it was mentioned that the time requirement for monitoring and management through the web interface was one to two hours per week. Is it assumed that this task falls to a building manager or is there a specialist that is or can be contracted to monitor and manage the system? If so, did the economics take into account these labors, labor hours as an O&M cost? So uh, your assumption that this task falls on a building manager is a good one. I think that it could fall on a building manager, an energy manager. It could also fall on if there's like a sustainability director or somebody at a kind of a headquarter level that oversees all the stores. Um, for one of these, that was initially our main contact. But we do find that whoever is doing this really does need to have good, uh, really good familiarity with the building, with the operations, great contact and knowledge of the staff on site. And so somebody, you know, managing this remotely is definitely doable, but uh, they just need to have that really good uh, knowledge of the site and contact with people on site. So um, I think that's probably the most common uh, kind of a situation where it's somebody within that entity. I, I would imagine that IBIS could um, be contracted to monitor and manage. I mean, their online data interface, like I said, does some analytics. They're very knowledgeable about plug loads. And so I would think that they could largely take on that role, that those costs associated with them serving as more of the champion uh, is not included in the cost. Uh, the equipment costs and O&M costs that we did for this study. Um, but I really think that you do need somebody that's intimately familiar with that site, the operations, and the staff. Okay, and that's all I see, Kim. It, um, I actually see quite a few more questions here. Um, another one oh, we have... Right. Are, uh, can you explain some of the challenges that you encountered with controlling equipment that you noted was this due to the PLM technology or the equipment that was being controlled uh, I think it was uh, the latter and I think that um, the so in test site a which was the pet related retail store in Arizona that store had sockets that went missing and uh, kind of faulty or um, inconsistent data sets. In that store, we did not, we were not made aware of staff that were having problems with the sockets and with the controls of devices. So in that store, there were, you know, again, no complaints or no questions or no issues that we were made aware of or that IBIS was made aware of uh, associated with the operations and the control of those devices. The second site, which we called Test B, which was the Hawaii eyewear site, that one we were made aware of staff 
uh, reporting that maybe a device wasn't turning on when it was supposed to be turning on according to the control schedule uh, and reporting that they weren't able to override that and then um, removing the socket. And so that store had numerous problems associated with that. And so I'm not, I think that it's a multitude of problems of maybe a, a schedule was set incorrectly. Maybe they were working at a time outside of the normal, you know, time we had assumed for when we set the schedule. Also, they didn't have the proper education and awareness of how to properly overwrite it and who to contact. Uh, for more information on the system, and so it resulted in them just removing those sockets. Um, the IBIS system does have an ability to set up alerts where uh, if a device or if a socket is no longer collecting data or is unplugged or if uh, data isn't transmitted for a certain amount of time. And so both Rose and I set those up and we're receiving those, and as was our partner with IBIS. But she informed us accurately and we discovered that it is like an overabundance of alerts that you get because even if the system just stops transmitting data for a little blip of five seconds, you'll get an alert that it's off and it's back on. And so, you know, when it's dozens or hundreds of devices, it becomes overwhelming to identify the true uh, alerts or the true, you know, problematic alerts that need an action versus ones that are just, oh, this, this tripped off and it's back on a few seconds later. Um, and so I think that that was one limitation of the alerts and of the system. And again, kind of drives out what we're estimating as one to two hours of somebody to really look at the data and realize, oh, this system, you know, this device has been on you know, not actually being being measured for a week or, um, you know, this socket's gone. <laughs> uh, so, so that's, you know, that drives some of that one to two hour recommendation that we came up with for management. Um, and let me just add, uh, in actually in the, in the pet retail store that we worked with, there was one device where the equipment was an issue uh, at working with the controls, and and we found out that the the pet tag, like the dog tag that you have for your your animals, that piece of equipment that makes those tags, use a ton of energy. But it was problematic to turn that machine off and back on again. A lot of times, the piece of equipment would just fail, so we couldn't actually control it. It had to be left on 24/7. But it brought to the attention of, of the owners of that retail store that that equipment used so much energy and that it was problematic for turning it off. So that gives them some power to say, okay, maybe there's a different piece of equipment that we could invest in that we can control and that uses less energy. So uh, that was kind of an interesting uh, outcome from from that store too. All right, everyone, this is Kim again, and we're, um, I now have a plethora of questions. So I think I'll ask um, one more to see if we have any time for that. Um, so the one is, any control algorithms that have been embedded into these socket devices, such as to automatically shut down the plug in devices um, or have the time automatically scheduled? A control algorithm. Question. Uh, and Allison, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to answer that one. Uh, at this point in time, the IBIS uh, PLM system does not have embedded automatic controls, but I know that that's something that in this field they're working on developing and understanding, you know, how do we classify devices together or how do we look at different uh, areas of of a building, uh, for instance, in an office space, can you look at uh, devices that are commonly used, like a, a multifunction printer, and turn that off automatically? Uh, so I know that there is research happening in that space to understand how do you classify devices and how would you implement automatic shutoff controls with that? So, but it, it's not available at this time. Okay, great. Thanks, Rose. Um, so I think we have about five minutes left, and I have a ton other a ton of other questions, but I would like to give um, 
some people on the call the opportunity to talk about um, any projects that they are working on that are related to this project. And if we need if we need kind of a discussion question, um, I think the question is, uh, what are some of the best practices that you know of for plug load metering with these um, plug load metering and control devices? So if anybody has anything to contribute to um, those thoughts, um, I think Holt, we should allow people to talk. And feel free to um, feel free to chime in. Hey, Kim, everyone's muted. Um, but I think if folks have something to contribute, why don't you um, let us know via the question portal, and then I think I can. Um, add you um, to as a presenter where you can speak. So if you have something to contribute, um, let us know and then we'll add you to the uh, presenter role and unmute you and you can talk. Okay, so um, I'm not seeing anybody else ask. I'll ask one more question. Um, and this one is, are you familiar with any product technologies out there that incorporate lighting, HVAC, and plug load receptacles into one control system? I understand designers are having a hard time finding products that integrate together into a space, which then requires more zone by zone calculations. Um, Rose, would you like to take that one or would you like me to take that one? Um, sure, I can talk to it a little bit, but maybe you can elaborate on, on some of these. Um, but as, as Kim mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, we're, we're starting to look more at uh, research to truly integrate systems. I know I've seen a couple of products um, that I, I'm not sure if they're fully on the market right now, but looking at integrating some lighting controls with plug load controls and actually uh, through the Better Buildings Alliance uh, interior lighting campaign, they are offering a new category for innovative controls and that's really to look at whether there are examples of people combining both lighting and plug load controls or even lighting and HVAC controls or combining all three together. So uh, we're right now trying to, to reach out and, and find um, some examples and case studies of, of people doing this together and how they're actually controlling that. Um, and in addition, uh, the, the plug load team, so Kim, and Bennett will be leading some research efforts that fo that's focused on, you know, where are the true opportunities in integrating these systems together? How can it be done? And how can we push the market to, to make this happen in real buildings? Yes, thanks, Rose. Um, so right now, um, the lighting manufacturers have um, jumped on board and they are focusing on integrating plug load controls with lighting controls. So, um, the market is moving in that direction um, right now. Um, right at the Better Building Summit, our, the session that I highlighted earlier is going to um, focus on a couple pilot studies that have um, investigated technologies that integrate these controls. And so, uh, we'll, and so basically the bottom line there is that um, these things are being piloted right now. Um, in collecting data on these pilots. So um, it's an emerging area and we're looking forward to finding more about this in July. All right. Yes, yes. Hi, this is Steve Schmidt from Home Energy Analytics. And regarding the report, I thought the report was great. We do something similar in the residential space. So we focus on uh, residential energy efficiency out here in California and uh, we've seen that there's a huge opportunity uh, mitigating plug loads to get overall overall savings. We don't, uh, we've been working with a similar uh, product from a company called Kiwi, and we've kind of adopted a three-pronged approach or a three-phased approach. We use smart meter data to identify buildings that have high plug load problems. Mainly it's stand, uh, high standby loads, but 
that seems to be mostly caused by plug loads. So we first use the smart meter data, which is very cheap to analyze, and find the buildings or the homes that have very high plug loads. Then we will install a bunch of these Kiwi uh, devices for as many of their devices as they can, uh, as many as the home's devices as possible, to identify to what we call a high idle load. Then we will move most of the monitors out and then focus on mitigating the, the worst loads. So we rent the devices from Kiwi so it keeps the costs very low because we can move them from building to building. So uh, that's the approach we came up with to try to reduce the economics or improve the economics of, of doing this type of monitoring. Thanks very much. Great, thanks Steve, thanks for that contribution. And we're at the top of the hour, so um, uh, I'm going to close the conference call now, but if anybody has any follow-up questions, please reach out to um, me and we'll get back to you soon. Um, yes, so thanks everyone and have a wonderful day. <laughs>